This week has been a week full of stories. We lost so many dear members of our community this week. And as we were hearing all of the stories, there's one that, that has just been sitting with me, a story of our beloved Hanna Berkowitz, who was such a pillar in our community. And as we were sitting with her family this week, sharing stories about her life, I was just starting to process what a powerful teacher she was for me personally and for our whole community. I remember when I, when I first came to Temple Emmanuel in 2016, Hannah was just always here. Any class, any lecture, any service, she was always here in her signature bright colors. She had the most amazing bright purple suit, and she was always a font of wisdom, always there with her full presence. And at the end of whatever session it was, she, she would always come up to me or call me over and give me a very long blessing all in Hebrew that I mostly understood, but I did understand the, the feeling behind it, the sense behind it of, of just deep connection and deep hope. She always, if you asked her, how are you? She would always say something so positive, something so grateful, something so uplifting. And every interaction she ended with her signature, chibuk shel ahava, a hug of love. It was so powerful. I remember asking around, like, what's her secret? How does she do this? She's always so positive. She's always so present, always so joyful. And what I was told was so surprising. People said, you know, she's a Holocaust survivor. It wasn't until this week that I learned Hannah's story of survival. She was 13 when she and her mother and her two brothers and her grandmother were sent to Auschwitz. Her mom had heard through the grapevine that children were not surviving at Auschwitz, and so she made Hannah put on all these extra layers of clothing on the cattle car. And Hannah, as an emerging adolescent, was not pleased with that decision. It was hot and uncomfortable. She didn't understand why she had to put on all these extra clothes. She was frustrated. And so when they got to Auschwitz, the doors opened and she ran ahead of her family. When she got to the front of the line, Mangala pointed her in the direction of life and behind her sent her entire family to the gas chambers. That kind of loss is unfathomable, especially in that moment, knowing about Hannah's spirit that brought her forward, that saved her life, and then to lose everyone behind. I just kept thinking about what, it, what would it have been like to be a 13-year-old there, trying to process that, trying to survive, trying to figure life out. And we all know that was just the beginning. But somehow, Hannah, even then, had this ability to look through the darkness and focus on the light. Her daughter, Naomi, this week shared that Hannah didn't hate anyone, even Mengele. Her son in love, Mike, shared a story that she had told him hundreds upon hundreds of times. It was a story about when she was 13 on her way to Auschwitz. And she wanted him to know, she wanted him to remember that on her way, there was a Nazi shoulder who showed her, soldier who showed her kindness, who gave her a pair. Those were the stories that Hannah clung to. It's just so amazing to me, Hannah's ability to metabolize trauma and loss into positivity. Hannah's determination not to allow her mind to get stuck, to wallow in the pain of the past. No, she sought out positivity. She sought out light, even in that darkness, and she clung to it. And even 
when she was physically suffering, even when she was experiencing mental anguish, she made the choice to articulate gratitude. This week, I just kept thinking, that's not inevitable. That doesn't just happen. It would have been so easy for her to allow that darkness to overcome her life. So how do we do that? This week, we're reading the famous story of the spies. We just read it. We all know the story. God tells Moses, you got to perform a feasibility study. Go send some scouts into the land. Figure out. How is it going to be? You know, they should take notes. What's the agriculture like? What's the soil quality? What are their fortifications? What do the people look like? And so Moses assembles a group and sends them out. And they go into the land. And they come back. First of all, they come back with delicious produce, like scrumptious, perfect, beautiful fruits, grapes so large it took two people to schlep those grapes, one single bunch of grapes. And they get back and they say, oh my God, the land, it's beautiful. The produce is scrumptious, delicious, perfect. It's literally flowing with milk and honey. Except when we saw the people, we felt like grasshoppers. It's just, it's not possible. Sorry, we can't go. No way. God is furious. God's like, are you kidding? I brought you all the way here for you to go perform this feasibility. You were supposed to come back and say, it's great. Move on. God's so angry. God says, fine. You don't think it's possible? You can stay in the desert. And so an entire generation is stranded in the middle of nowhere, halfway between slavery and redemption. I always thought that this story was about the people's inability to imagine the unknown. That they just couldn't imagine what it would be like to live in a new place, to live amongst new people, that they just, they couldn't get their brains there. But this week, hearing Hannah's story, I started to wonder if maybe it was not a fear of the unknown, but rather a fear of the known. What if the people were so deeply enmeshed in memories of pain and trauma that that repetitive thought pattern sabotaged their present and prevented them from embracing a positive future? Think about it. The people had lived up to this point as slaves in Egypt. Undoubtedly, they were the victims of cruelty, of oppression, for sure. They witnessed suffering, probably experienced it themselves, and they leave Egypt, and they're walking along, and you can just imagine that they're just thinking about all of that pain and all of that suffering, and they're getting that in their mind, and they keep going there, and they keep going there, and they keep going there, and that means that when they see the plagues, it's just all they're thinking about is the suffering that they experienced, and when they see the new land, all they're thinking about is the suffering they've experienced. When they see those people, all they see are the Egyptians that they left behind, what they knew, what they knew of people that were not Jews, and so they can't imagine going forward because they're like, those people are going to do what the Egyptians did to us. We can't get there. Our Torah gives us a warning. All of us go through challenging moments. All of us have our own stories of trauma. But our deepest challenge is to be able to look through those stories, to find the light and move forward, because otherwise we have problems. It happens in superficial ways. I was thinking this week about a a pattern I've settled into I'm, I'm not a fan of. If anyone asks me how I am, I tend to say how many hours of sleep I've gotten. Or whether or not my child has an ear infection. And I was realizing that, like, I'm failing the Hana lesson. I don't want to just be like, I got four hours of sleep and I'm so exhausted every single day. When I say that, when I focus on that, I actually miss the magic of being a mom. I miss the magic of having a little toddler who wants to get up in the middle of the night and see me. That's kind of amazing. 
it happens with kids too. I see this all the time. I, I work with teens and I'll talk to a teen and they'll say like, I'm just, not, I'm not good at that. I'm not good at math. I'm not good at science. I'm not good at English. I'm just not good at it. The translation of that is not that I'm not good at it. It's that I got a bad grade on this assignment or this teacher made me feel like I wasn't good at this. It's not a predictive reality. It's a reflective reality. And yet when they have that identity, when they have that reflection about themselves, it makes it very difficult to inhabit the promised land. And who knows? Who knows what their mission is in this world? Who knows what it is that they can accomplish? And it happens in big ways, too. I, I think about this in the context of our Jewish community post-October 7th. All of us are feeling so deeply wounded by that horrific attack. All of us are not just thinking about what happened then, but about all of the pogroms, about the Holocaust, about all of the intensity of our past. We're so enmeshed in those painful memories. And I worry. I worry that that means that we're seeing anti-Semites everywhere, that we're seeing everything as a threat. And I worry, what are we missing? What are we missing by being so stuck in that pain? And I don't have a good answer. I don't know how to get out. I want Hannah to be here to tell us, how did you do it? How did you get out of that mindset? But how did you make that choice? Because she really did. She made it out of Auschwitz. She made it literally to the promised land. She became a nurse. She married her beloved Baruch. She moved to Newton. She joined Temple Emmanuel. She raised three beautiful children and watched them grow into adulthood and raise their own families. And she lived to see her grandchildren have children. She had this ability to do magic. What was it? One thing I know, Hannah started and finished every day with Kaddish. She started and finished every day with Kaddish, which for her was not about death. It was about affirming life. It was about affirming her gratitude for life. She also deeply embraced Jewish tradition. She saw the power of lighting candles, of saying prayers, of directing consciousness. Positivity is not inevitable. Getting into the promised land, that's not inevitable. Hannah did it so beautifully. She modeled how to do it for each and every one of us. You're a scout. You have the ability to see. Noted on your feasibility study, it's possible. We can make it. We can all make it to the promised land. We rise.